all back from that exercise segment and I hope you indulged in it while it was on. Have a quick break now and when we come back there is more. Welcome back and so good to know you are still tuned to Good Morning Abuja. While we can no longer begin to overemphasize the importance of inculcating entrepreneurship into our educational curricula. My guest is already set in the studio with me this morning to discuss the importance of entrepreneurship in our educational system as a country. Please help me welcome my guest, the Global Director Africa House, Engineer Abayomi Ondo Sonia. Good morning to you. Good morning, thank you for having me. Always a pleasure to have you. Thank you, thank you. It's a pleasure to thank you so much. And welcome. Thank you, appreciate it. All right, in the first place, how, how important is entrepreneurship? to us as in, in, in the, talking about the Nigerian economy. All right, good morning, Abuja. Good morning, Nigeria. Thank you for having me. Our entrepreneurship um, is vital to the survival of any nation. And uh, Nigeria being a very unique and uh, wonderful country, uh, a country of more than 200 million, according to the last uh, statistical data. And out of that, you've got like seven, more than 70% of that are, are the youth, you see. So the question is, can, do we have a system that can absorb all these young, intelligent, uh, young folks? Do, in order for you to be able to absorb them, you need to ensure that you push them towards entrepreneurship, which basically means ability to generate an income for yourself, or simply put, become an employer of labor. And in order for us to do that, because if we're going to sit around and think we can all look for a white-collar job, all of us will work in government and work in a private establishment, but the truth is that that school of thought is no longer sustainable, and there's a need for the Nigerian population to be entrepreneurial, which basically means creating value that people are willing to pay for, not only within Nigeria, also outside Nigeria. And adding to that, the, the, the truth is that... Um, a lot of people claim to be entrepreneurs in Nigeria and Africa as a whole, but the truth is not many of us actually know how to make money. And this is one controversial statement I make, like Africans don't know how to make money. And people say, what do you mean Africans don't know how to make money? Because the truth is the education we've been, we've been taught over the last several decades since independence has always been geared towards graduate, get a job, sit behind your desk for 35 years, you retire and wait for your pension. But the truth is, the reality in our current, current world has gone beyond that. Uh, first of all, the civil service cannot absorb several hundreds of millions of people at a single go. So we need to start thinking of how we can make money that the rest of the world, they're willing to pay for. Because if you say, I'm going to be a teacher, okay, fine, the teacher is doing well, is imparting knowledge. But then what about your students? Are they going to be teachers too? So the question is, what can we offer the rest of the world that they are willing actually to pay for. And it pains my heart because when we say entrepreneurship in Nigeria and most African countries, we all often think of certain things, you know, like, okay, fine, if I'm a lady, fashion design, if I'm a guy, uh, I'll be a mechanic or I'll be a plumber, I'll be, I'll be a computer guy and all that. But the, the truth is, the world, we need to re-engineer our thoughts and the, the entrepreneurial uh, skills that we're equipping ourselves to. So there's a huge need for us to actually sit down and we think the way we talk about entrepreneurship and instill that idea into the heart of every Nigerian, whether you're five years old, whether you're 80 years old, because the truth is for us to survive as a nation, as a continent, <laughs> we need to earn a lot of money. It's not easy to feed 200 million mouth. It's not easy. And of course, if we say we're going to depend on our oil and gas revenues, and of course we know it's simply not enough because uh, there are more than 80% of what we earn from our, fall, from our oil and gas industry goes back to service our debts, pay salaries and whatnot. And in fact, the sad story is we're actually borrowing money to pay salaries. So, you know, <laughs> it, it, that is very sad. So now what happens to the young people graduating from universities? And we discover that most of them now, if you notice there's a trend, a disturbing trend to that, that you see people, when they graduate, automatically they have this hope that, ah, what am I going to do? There's no job anyways. So you now see a family of maybe four children who are all graduates, and they're still at home with their parents, and their parents is fast approaching retirement age. What does he do? How long will he continue to feed those four educated uh, children he has? So the question is, we need to really, really rethink what entrepreneurship is in Nigeria in order to be able to move forward and then to build a prosperous uh, Nigeria. 
Are you serious? <laughs> wow, wow. <laughs> well, this, this, this angle you're coming from is an interesting one because, yes, in, two, in, in two, 2007, 2008, it became mandatory for all our institutions of learning in Nigeria to have what we call entrepreneurship education, which basically means every student that passes through our, our special institution must learn an entrepreneurship skill or the other. But unfortunately, this hasn't worked. That's just the reality. Because if it's working, then we wouldn't have unemployment rate as we have. Because the truth is, if I'm putting this in, then the results should, should show for it. It's not about the amount of money being pumped into the system, but rather the results. Because if the system were to be working, then you discover that the, the rate of unemployment amongst our youth will drop. You discover that people won't be moving around looking for jobs. You won't see children sitting at home saying, Daddy, buy me a child card for my phone. For my data. So clearly this system is not effective, but of course it can be salvaged. And this is where we're here today, this morning to discuss over. So there's so many schemes. In fact, not only in the schools, by the way, I hope you know that even in the within the public service, you see, the the is is one of the mandates of the government, even even past administrations too, to ensure that civil servants are taught entrepreneurship. And it's something, an area that I know very, very well because we partner with the federal government in, in this area of entrepreneurship and you discover that what they now do is they ensure that if you're a civil servant, they send you for entrepreneurship training just before you retire. And this is where me, I have, I have issue with it because why would you send someone who's two years to retirement to go and learn entrepreneurship? It's too late. So it has to be something that you have to learn the moment you enter the civil service, you start thinking of how to start a business. And another fault that we have in our system is they say they've restricted the civil servants only to agriculture, which to me is not fair. You see, what if I have a passion for media? And you're saying that the law says I can only do agriculture and farming. So basically, you're putting me in a corner. You're telling me I cannot explore my... What if I'm, I'm, I'm good in software engineering and I'm a media person? I'm an OAP, for example. So there are a lot of faults in the current system. But I believe the only way to fix this fault is, again, to start teaching, our, teaching ourselves skills that matter. And what do I mean by skills that matter? And... You know, like I said, when you say entrepreneurship, what comes to mind? Even you go to universities now, they tell you fashion designing, uh, cosmetics and makeup, um, agricultural processing, farming, snail farming, catfish farming. These are some of the things you will see on almost all the entrepreneurship centers in, in Nigeria, which is not bad. But what we fail to realize is that if all of us are doing all these things and we are always planning to sell to ourselves, so then the question is, who's going to buy from me? That's why you discover now in Nigeria today, there are a lot of people doing poultry business. But the question is, have you gone to the poultry shops lately? Who's buying? And because of the harsh economic realities, people that used to buy 10 kilos, 5 kilos of uh, the chicken every week now, they say, give me half kilo. Because I, I did a study on this. I actually went to, because I like to move around. So I, I sat in the chicken shop. And people say, hey, madam, how much is chicken per kilo? They give them the price. They say, hey, oh my God, this is the price. Okay, just give me half kilo. But that person used to buy 10 kilos, 20 kilos. Even stock is freezer with food. So the question is, whatever entrepreneurship skills we're teaching ourselves for the last 10, 20 years, or even 40 years, is aimed at, I'm producing something, I'm selling to the cameraman. He's producing something, he's selling to you. So basically, we're trying to shift the money that we have in our system. I have this analogy that I always use. I say, our economy is like a leaking drum that has water in it. Everybody's fetching and giving to the other guy within the drum. So we're still circulating the same money within the drum. But this is the solution. The solution is our entrepreneurship skills should be geared at attracting foreign money into our economy. So that, the, because you think about it, the more water you pour into that drum, the more water is available for all of us to share. The more satisfied we will be. So the question is, the guy doing the catfish should be taught how he or she can export that catfish. The lady doing cosmetics, which is a fantastic business, by the way, should be taught how to sell cosmetics products to Ghana, Niger, Chad, France, Italy. The, the guy doing media, the, that young boy or that young lady who's doing social media should be taught how to sell that content to people in the U.S. to earn millions and millions of dollars. So that way, money is being poured into our economy. So as a result of that, I no longer need to depend on selling to the cameraman. I don't, I don't need to depend on selling to you. So what would not happen is money is coming into me. And then I'm creating more jobs. So as graduates are coming out from school, come and work for me. I have money coming in to be able to take care of us. Interesting discussion here, I must say, this morning. We'll take a quick break now. And when we come back, there is more. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. 
back and good to know that you are still tuned to the program. Engineer Abayam, with all these schemes and everything we have, what do you think is being done wrong? What, what, why do you think we're not getting the desired results? Um, yes, that's a good one. Uh, why we're not getting the desired results is we're teaching ourselves archaic skills. We're not updating the knowledge according to the world uh, economy. And the truth is, like I said earlier, is that we, whatever we learn or whatever we're teaching ourselves has to be a skill that is relevant on the global scale. We live in a global economy. Whatever, it's no longer sustainable for me to sell to you, for you to sell to him or for him to sell to her. It's no longer sustainable because in, in the end, what makes a country great is how much of money you can earn in terms of foreign income. That's what actually matters. Because you discover that if we keep circulating what we have within ourselves, a time will come that that money will no longer be enough for us to, to move around within ourselves, within our economy, because we keep giving birth every day. That God knows how many thousands of children that were born today. So in order to start feeding those extra millions of mouths that will come into our economy every day, every year, we need to now start looking outward. And that's what many nations are doing. If you look at China, you know what China, I discovered one fantastic thing about China. When China was growing as an economy in the, in the emerging economy in the 70s, they ensure that when they were teaching entrepreneurial skills, they say, listen, you're manufacturing your phone. Fine, go ahead. Make your mistakes. Be good at it. And then once you're good at it, they push you out there. Start selling your phones to the rest of the world. And now it will shock you. In the next five years, Chinese phones will kick out all these big, big brands that we know because they have a mindset of the global economy. We need to sell. We need to sell. So for, for, for a cosmetics producer, let's, start, let's, give in, let's give practical examples now. Let's say there's a student studying mass communication in the University of Lagos, for example. And then the, she or she is given a choice to choose which entrepreneurship course is she, she's going to learn. So if she says, okay, fine, I want to choose cosmetics and beauty. And then she says, okay, fine, I want to learn how to formulate uh, body cream, air cream, and all that. And then she, 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 she's been taught that, listen, beauty, goes, beauty cream or beauty product goes beyond just formulating something. You need to understand what is the entire value chain of the beauty industry. He or she now will now know that, oh, okay, I can actually use shea butter that we have in Nigeria, and shea butter is, is a sought-after product in all these formulations that the Western product shoots. She will also be taught, or she should be taught, how to package according to international standards, not all those, like we say, Nausa Gura Gura. It has to be done very well, because if you, are, you want to sell that cosmetics, you're making a Lego to someone in France, the packaging has to be impeccable. So she has to be taught that, okay, what do I write on the label? What does the law in France say when I want to sell anything to France? Because in Nigeria, I've seen a lot of products that makes me angry as a business person. The guy just, fantastic product, horrible packaging. The guy will just go and print the paper, and even some people will just put tape and write beauty cream. It's just ridiculous. You know, the product is, is better than any foreign product, in fact, but the problem is you or she does not even know finishing. Thank you. You need to know that in America, you have to put your, what's it called, your, your label it in English or probably Spanish. If you want to sell to Russia, it has to be in Russian and any other language. So you need to know all those things. You need to know that, okay, if I want to formulate my cream in my backyard, I have to use stainless steel equipment. She has to know what are the NAFDAQ rules, what is the FDA laws for me to be able to sell to the So that way, when she knows all those skills that matter, like I call it, then she knows that the moment I'm done with my university, she'll say, I'm not looking for a job. I already know what it takes to sell this cream to the U.S. market. And she will discover that there's a huge demand for those beauty creams made from shea butter for the African-American air. And I always say this in every platform I get. I hope you know that in America, they have 30 million African-Americans. And African-Americans have a unique skin and air. We, most of us have curly hair. And the products that they find in an American stores are designed for the Caucasian hair, straight hair, Chinese hair, Indian hair. So African Americans find it difficult to find a, a product that matches their skin and their body because nobody has looked at that. But that lady in the University of Lagos has been taught that. The professor said, oh, guys, see, oh, there's a market for this particular niche. Target the African Americans, target the Hispanic and the mixed races because their hair is curly. So she knows that. So the moment she's graduating, she's loaded with knowledge that matters. So she will not even look for a job. Within six months, she'll start exporting to the US. She'll be employing 200, 300 people to expand our operations. Those are the kind of skills we teach. Not, not just tell her, don't worry, go on, this is how to formulate cream. Mix camphor with the shea butter, put, put oruru, and then <laughs> you have a beauty product. No, it, it has to go beyond that. Let's take fish as an example too. Catfish, fantastic business. I, was, I always tell people, I said this in Russia, so I said, listen, there's a fish called uh, uh, beluga. Beluga is a fish 
uh, uh, or they call it Uzumburun in, in the Caspian area, is it has the same uh, biology as catfish. And this fish is what produces caviar. 20 grams of caviar can be sold for 500 euros, 200 euros. Exactly. So if you are if you're able to raise catfish successfully in Nigeria, you can raise that beluga in your fish pond in your house. That means once you are producing that particular fish, you are harvesting the eggs, you can export to the rest of the world. They are doing it in the Caspian countries, Kazakhstan, Iran, Tajikistan, they are all doing this. So but no one has ever taught us that catfish has the same similarity with this beluga. People don't even know what a beluga fish is to start with on Barracuda. Nobody even know. So these are the skills. Africans need to be taught skills that matter. Social media, for example, a lot of young folks are going to social media, which is fantastic. But the question is, how much of how many of them are actually making money? Because when you may be famous, but you may be broke. Many people don't know that. Most of them are famous but broke. So in order to keep up with that fake lifestyle, some of them go into fraud. They go to uh, black magic or whatever they call it to be able to make money. But why do why fake what can be real? Meanwhile, in the US, there are people that's all they do. They sit down, make a video, and then they are paid twenty, thirty thousand dollars a month. But we've not taught our children that listen, these are the secrets of how to make money on social media. You 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 know that per thousand views you get on this platform, you are paid five hundred dollars. Per five hundred views on this platform, people paid so and so. And another thing I want to talk about is what we call tech racism. Many people don't know this. Tech racism. Tech racism is basically there are some platforms, global platforms, that deliberately restricts Nigeria and some African countries from monetizing their content. If you were in the US and you're on that platform and your content is very, very good, you make millions in a month without any sweat. All they need is your creativity, but we've been deliberately blocked. This is where our government and our people need to come together and challenge those platforms. Say, listen, we're living in a global economy. Fight for these children so they can start making money. And I cannot emphasize enough how brilliant Nigerians are. We are super brilliant. I mean, I always like to use this example. There's a young boy in one village, I don't know where, they got me the video about the telephone brand, you know, comparing to telephone brand. In the one dirty little background like that, in, in one, probably a ghetto. And that video got 9 million views across the world. The phone brand became embarrassed. They had to sign that boy. Say, oh, wow, this guy got us 9 million free advertisements without paying a couple. So they now said, okay, okay, I come, I come and sign a contract. So imagine if Nigerians know that if you're able to create a content that generates views, that you can be paid so and so and so millions of naira or whatever, then we don't need to worry about unemployment. We'll have children who are taught the right way. So you don't need to do Yahoo, Yahoo or internet scam to make money. There are platforms that you can make money from legally. These are skills that matter. Not necessarily learn how to braid hair, open a fashion design shop. And if I go into fashion, I don't think we'll have enough time to talk about fashion. Because fashion goes beyond, I'm a tailor, I'm sewing very nice clothes, kaftan, fantastic. But do you know how many nations of the world actually love our fabric? How many opportunities are there for Nigerian fashion designers to sell to the US, to Europe, to Russia? In some countries, I remember it happened to me once in the Middle East. I was wearing one African, they said, whoa, I love this, please, can you be supplying me this? Now, I might, and Nigerians don't know, but we're here in Garaki, sewing clothes, praying to God every day, God let customers come. Where your customers are there. You cannot teach what you don't know. It's that simple. And some of these skills you cannot see in the textbooks because the nations that have these skills, they won't even tell you because it's their secret. It's the, how the economy is growing. So we need to expose our trainers. Not everybody can teach entrepreneurship. We need to look at successful people who actually have walked the talk because it's easy to carry a textbook and say, I'm a professor of uh, entrepreneurship because I have a PhD in entrepreneurship. I'm not, I have nothing against uh, being, I have a PhD. I started mine, I didn't complete it. So <laughs> pardon me for that. But what I'm trying to say is it goes beyond textbooks. You need to look for successful people in the society and say, hey, you come, please. Help us talk to these children. Show them the things they don't know. Then it becomes, the, the children see a picture, not a lecturer just writing chalk on the board and telling them, uh, in 1922, Lord Mugat said this. No, no, it, we need to be practical and hands on. Get successful people within the country and from the diaspora. Go to the U.S., sponsor, maybe someone who's successful in tech. Bring him from the U.S., pay him, of course, pay him, because if you think it's free, it won't work. Pay the guy, come to Nigeria, speak to maybe a thousand university students over a period of, of one week, and let them know that these are the secrets of how big nations are being built. That way, you will touch the lives of these children forever. You see, bring successful people, not just people who have theory textbooks and what. No, no, textbooks is good, but 
practical hands-on training. You see, and like I said, get me in front of any group of students. I, I can assure you, you will not leave that room. Your life will change. If you talk to me for an hour and you're a student, you will rethink your education because we need people like that. So to be able to teach people, expose them, see it in the real sense. This guy has done it before. So it's not just uh, in chapter two of this textbook, I saw this, I saw that. So I believe practical, uh, practical uh, explanation is the way to go about this. Well, thank you so much, sir, for always coming to give us insights into thank nation you. building. We thank you so much. Thank you very much. That's the much we can take on today's discussion with Engineer Abayomi. Not to worry, he'll be here again real soon to give us more insights into what we can always do differently as a nation to be more, more successful. After the break, there is more to come on Good Morning Abuja. Please stay with us. It's so good to know that you're still tuned to the program this morning. Well, our next topic of discussion is making the right business decisions in a tough economy. I have with me already on, on set my next guest. She is the co-founder, The Natural Place. Let's, let's meet and welcome Jane Ola. Good, good morning. morning and welcome to the show. Good morning. It's so good to have you here. Same here. Thank you. Thank you. All right, first of all, how can an entrepreneur determine whether the decisions they are making is a viable one or not? Okay, the first, as an entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneur, the first question you should ask yourself is, the product or service, how important is it to your customers? Is it value-driven? Uh, because the economy is already tough and people are trying to cut costs. So whatever you're going to be doing is something that someone can look back and decide to, okay, this is very important. For example, you know that most persons give little attention to their feeding and the natural place is in place to help them know that fruit is very important. The vitamins that you can actually get is either you take fruit as a fun thing or you take it as medicine. It's either way. So we allow people to know that it's very important. It's good for you to eat the day to day, but it's important to also give attention to your feeling, your wellness and everything you take. So the entrepreneur needs to understand what their value, that's if their business is value driven, what does your business bring to the table? That's one. The second thing is customer retention, getting your customer and having to keep them. Then the entrepreneur has to also think about flexibility and visibility. You need to know that things are changing. It's a tough economy. Things are changing and you need to change with the things and not lose your value as an entrepreneur. How entrepreneurs need to prioritize their different business needs, giving limited resources. Okay, there's something called a priority metrics. There are things that are urgent, but are not important. There are things that are important, they are not urgent. There are things that are urgent and they're important. So it goes. So the first question you ask yourself is, this decision I'm about to take, is it urgent? Is it important to my business? For example, I run a wellness business. The question is, how do I get more customers? So I think about running a Facebook ad. Is it important? Yes. Because when I run a Facebook ad, I get to meet more people for the business. So these are questions that you ask. If the things are not very important as a business owner or as a startup, you let it slide. You don't have to do big things or do things that big brands are doing until you get there. But when you know you're starting, you ask yourself, is it urgent? You prioritize your needs. Now, how can an entrepreneur evaluate whether to invest in new technology or methods, you know, when the budget is not much? Okay, we know that there's risks and there's revenue. When you ask yourself, okay, I want to invest in something, what are the risks? Is it uh, these risks, are, the, are there risks that I could manage or there are risks? Because there are some, some investments you make that will crumble your business. Yes, it will cripple your business at once. But there are some risks that even if you encounter on the way, you can always start. So the question is, are these risks, the revenue I'm going to be putting into this risk, is this something that will cripple me? Is this something I could afford? If anything comes 
or happens or a challenge or I face a challenge? Is it something I could just dust off? It's going to be painful, but is it something I could dust off and continue with the business? That's the question. It's not, for example, uh, I have people that are already into this. There are some things that they do that I can't do because I'm just beginning in the business. So I, ask, I know that it's time. A time will come, I will do the same thing that they're doing, but right now, I will take it one step at a time. So is the risk, the revenue that I'll put in the risk, is it commensurate to closing down my business or going if a challenge comes? Mm, still on that, some entrepreneurs might want to expand all too soon, especially for a business that is still starting out. What do you think this, this can lead to? I think we should build capacity. Capacity building is not something you do in a day. There's some persons that, okay, the, the vision I even have for this, we have for this uh, business was something so big. But early this year, I, myself and the founder, we sat down and said, maybe our capacity has not even gotten to this thing that we have written. Why not start with what we have? So it's not about expanding. It's your ability to be able to retain what you've started. We have seen people invest 100 million, 150, 200, and all of a sudden, after one year, there's no business. But you see somebody that started with just 500K and the person is building it. So I think as a startup, one of the, even if you have the resources, I think that you should try to build your capacity with time. As you see that you can handle, you could pay one person, two persons, you start employing more persons because of what time has a way of revealing things well i hope you learned a thing also there with this discussion with the co-founder the natural place start regardless from where you are it is possible to build your business from ground all the way up stay with us on the show we continue right after the break welcome back it's still our discussion segment on good morning abuja and we're discussing making the right business decisions in a tough economy. We still have with us the co-founder for The Natural Place, Jane Ola. Now tell us, um, what methods would one use to retain customers when they are tightening their budgets? How can they retain their customers still? Okay. Uh, one of the mistakes most persons do is because of the toughness or because of the economy hardship, they tend to reduce their value with time. It, that is what the, their customer know them for. They tend to reduce it with time. But one of the things, one of the things that uh, an entrepreneur or a startup can do for a business to retain customers is let your value be the same. No matter the cost of anything. It's, it, it's better for you to explain to your customers that things are on the high side and you increase your price and reduce your value. Because I see people doing that. They say, uh, people will not get, the truth is, there are customers that will always afford you. But if you reduce your quality because you want to retain, the truth is most persons will go. So let your quality be the same, no matter how, instead up your, 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 your money or the price you're putting because you know the value you're giving to your customers. And because of that, they can. And one of the things that you could also do to retain uh, customers is always being visible. There's something called visibility in business, marketing. Uh, everybody, most persons are doing what you're doing. But what, what's that one thing that will make a customer remember, okay, you're baking cake, let's say, and the person has like 10 persons that do the same thing. What's that one thing that you do differently that will make the customer remember when he or she wants to bake a birthday cake? It's called visibility. You're always in the face of your customers. They're always seeing your, 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 your content, value-driven content, not just because you want to sell to them, there are always something that if they go to your page, there's one or two things they can learn from you. They go to your WhatsApp status, there's something they can learn. So you're always visible. It's like uh, using the social media as, as an example. So you use it to your advantage. You're always there, just seeing you, you're posting, you're letting people know the benefits of what you're doing. It's, when you show people the benefits of your product, I tell you, they will have to stay and get it. Talk to us about consistency. 
even when you're not making so much profit what is the need to stay consistent consistency is one of the major ingredients in business uh, because as a startup you may not actually get all the things that you envisage at the start even the number of customers imagine you're starting with let's say one or two customers or one or two sales in a week and you decide to say oh because i just have one or two sales in a week or one or two customers i am tired i want to give up but the person that has consistent sale daily did not start with consistent sale daily it means that there was an ingredient the person put being consistent being there even when it looks like nothing is happening the person is there so it's very important for startups to know that you cannot make do off. You cannot take consistency out of business. That's why you see some persons, they start business today. In less than six months, they are doing another. Because they don't have the power to, but it's something that you tell yourself. That's why I said that you have to have a mental picture. Where are you seeing yourself? That alone will help you to be consistent. If you can see yourself in 10 years, if you can see yourself in five years, Starting will not be a challenge. You just know that this is where I'm going to, and I'll be consistent. Well, thank you so much for coming this morning. We have learned a whole lot from you. Well, business is doable. You can start it. You can stay consistent, and you can grow that business today from the ground all the way up. What have you learned from us today on Good Morning Abuja? Stay with us on the show. There is more when we come back.